In January, it was the 55th anniversary of the Apollo 1 fire, and today we speak to George Leopold and Matthew Bedingfield, who have just started a new blog called Recalling Apollo. The blog is an attempt to document the events and lasting consequences of that fire from a Gus Grissom biographer and a whistleblowing lawyer who is the grandson of the last remaining survivor of the fire. It is a heavy subject, but we hope you enjoy it. And let us know your thoughts at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Or drop us a message via our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, where you can also find links to any articles we've mentioned and an archive of all of our previous shows and their show notes too. But right now, it's time for episode 80 of the Space and Things Podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 80 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm hanging in there, hanging in there, getting ready for uh, next week. I'm getting a minor surgery, but I will be fine. I will be back very soon, so no, no need to be alarmed. Well, I hope that goes well, obviously. But we do have some shows pre-recorded for why you're recovering. Uh, but I do look forward to having you back and us doing this weekly again. I'm sure it won't be too long. Uh, but Emily, did you release an article on the Celestius blog this week. Yes, there is an article that um, I put out. I wrote it a little while back, but it's called the Celestius Connects. And it's basically how at um, at each of their launch events that Celestius has, and they have several launches coming up this year, if you check out their website, you know, a lot of the people at the events have kind of gone through the same thing. A lot of them obviously have lost family members and are there for that reason. And it's just kind of an article about how, you know, those events are really uniquely, you know, unifying. There's kind of, I don't know if I'd call it an overview effect, but something similar there. You know, everybody's kind of has a shared experience, I guess. So uh, it's definitely unifying. And I, I wrote a little bit about that. Those articles can be kind of heavy because really I'm writing about the end of, you know, people's end of life choices. And I that... That is kind of a heavy thing to write about, but I try to make it, you know, positive as much as I can. So I hope you enjoy those articles and I love my friends at Celestius. Yeah, it's a great article. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I, I hadn't thought about the idea of there being a bond and a connection between those those people either. It was, uh, it was really interesting to read about. It's kind of a neat experience because as crazy as it sounds, you know, a shared experience you know, seeing the launch and, and going through, you know, grief even, it's kind of a, you know, people can bond over that in a way. So it, it makes you realize, well, I'm not all alone in the world, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Roger, we've been trying to talk to you for a while here. So on to this week's main feature. On January 27th, 1967, astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were taking part in a launch rehearsal test within their Apollo command module that they were due to fly the following month as part of the first crewed mission of the Apollo program. This test, known as the Plugs Out test, aimed to see if the spacecraft would operate as it should have while detached from all cables and umbilicals. It was a test performed for all Gemini and Mercury missions, but this time there were problems from the start. Uh, the astronauts were struggling to communicate, with the operations and checkout building, and there was a strange smell inside Grissom's suit. As required for this test, the air in the cabin was replaced with pure oxygen at high pressure. Six and a half hours into the test, with everything saturated with that pure oxygen, an exposed wire sparked underneath Grissom's foot and a fire began. Due to the high pressure environment and the inward facing door, it was impossible for the three to escape. The accident and the death of the three astronauts was a national tragedy, and there was a huge investigation of which is still much publicly unknown. It's often said that this accident and the changes in design to the command module as a result of the investigation ensured that the Apollo program was a success in landing a man on the moon and bringing him back safely to Earth. I believe if Apollo 1 had actually flown, if some reason they had actually made it beyond that point, they would have uh, launched on February 21st, 1967, and it would have been an orbital test of the Block 1 command module. 
And to this day, I mean, I, I've read the explanations for it, obviously. I don't want to get a million emails like, you didn't know this? Yeah, I knew it, but it's very mystifying to me why they had a block one and a block two. Yeah, agreed. Anyway, details of, of the fire have appeared in many books, films and documentaries, but there is still so much that we don't know about it. And today's guests are attempting to do something about that. So George Leopold has previously released a book called Calculated Risk, The Supersonic Life and Times of Gus Grissom. And it's a great book if you're interested. Friend of the podcast, Francis Frentz, had this to say about it. Calculated Risk fills an important space history gap. Most books cover the Apollo 1 fire, a turning point in Cold War and the space race in many ways, but get a lot of details wrong. This book is one of the best ever written in terms of its accuracy. Also, Matthew Bedingfield is a whistleblower attorney, and his grandfather is the last remaining survivor of the fire. The two of them have teamed up to start a blog called Recalling Apollo, and the aim is to document the events and lasting consequences of the fire. They've also set up an Instagram, and there are some incredible images already gone up, uh, which I'd not previously seen. So we thought we'd invite them to talk to us about what they're up to. I don't think it'll be... uh probably a whole lot worse than a guy that's making a first test flight on a new airplane. I've never done that, so I don't know. I think everybody feels a little apprehensive uh, when they count down. I don't see how you could help but be a little bit excited, but I don't think anybody is, uh, you know, I, I don't like to use the word scary. I, I definitely think you're apprehensive and you're considering what's involved there. You're thinking about it, but you know how to handle it and take care of it and do the job. Welcome, George and Matthew, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're really honored to have you guys here. So let's start with George. What led you to writing a book about, you know, Gus Grissom? This is somebody who really hasn't had a voice in, our, in a really long time. Yeah, uh, as you know, uh, there's he never got a chance to write his memoirs. He did get one book about Gemini that was posthumously published, but it always seemed to me there was this huge gap in this, you know, the central part of the human space flight, you know, before and after the fire. And one thing that, one thing that struck me was when uh, John Young, uh, the only guy who ever flew in space with Gus, uh, they walked in, looked at the Apollo uh, one command module and said, Gus, why don't you say something about this wiring? It's terrible. And Gus, he claims Gus said, well, if I say anything, they'll fire me. And I think what he meant was he would lose his place in in the line of uh, Apollo astronauts who of course all thought they could fly the crate the thing came in. So I, th I thought, gosh, is that all this guy gets? And uh, I literally went out to his grave one day at Arlington and said, I'm going to, I'm going to try to write this guy's story and gave it, gave it my best shot. When you were researching the book, was there anything that really surprised you about Gus or th something that you didn't know beforehand um, that, that really caught your eye that you felt that, that people didn't know? It, it wasn't really fatalism, but I think he was realistic about the risks. And, you know, that's the key theme of my book. His remarks like, you know, the longer uh, you're on the flight line, the better your chances of buying the farm. Or I think he told Deke Slayton, look, if we ever have an accident in this program, it's likely to be me. So, you know, if you get if you get the maiden flight of the two uh, flying machines over the space of 18 months, well, that's you're really hanging your hide out on the line. But, you know, he just kept plugging away. And Matthew, moving on to you, please explain to our listeners about your personal connection to the Apollo 1 fire. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, Dave and Emily, thanks so much for, for having us. It's, it's great to be able to be here and talk with you guys. So yeah, I, I'm one of a few grandchildren of uh, James Gleaves, who, to my knowledge, is really the last remaining survivor from the scene of the Apollo 1 fire. He was a lead mechanical tech on shift during the fire and was one of a few men who you know, rushed in in an attempt to rescue the three astronauts. The efforts failed, of course. But the men that went in were, at least in my opinion, incredible heroes, and they, they were awarded with NASA Medal for Exceptional Bravery. And it's a part of our family history, and I, I can kind of get further into that as, we, as the conversation goes on. But I, I'll kind of just start by saying that you know, Grandpa really didn't love talking about it growing up. I, I distinctly recall sitting in his Orlando lake house. He has this bookshelf. And... Uh, Lost Moon is one of the books on there. And 
flipping through it and I forget exactly who it was, but Kluger and Levitt spend the first chapter talking about the fire and, you know, the name James Gleaves pops up. And I think I was probably in middle school when I really recognized, hey, that's, that's grandpa and why is he there? And, you know, what's the story behind this? And, you know, in that time period, you know, if he was pressed on it, he really didn't like discussing it. He would say things, you know, to the extent of, you know, hey, well, you know, we did what we could. End of story. And you could tell the emotional trauma of the event was, was still with him. It still is to this day. And and I think in his age, he's he started to open up more. I mean, he has a healthy distrust for the media. I think he was misquoted a couple of times. And I think in his his view, certain people's recollections just weren't accurate of what happened. People try to elevate themselves to maybe be more of a figure in, in the event than they actually were. And, and that bothered him. So he, he just kind of remained silent, even to family members until, until very recently. How did the two of you end up connecting? Well, um, my recollection is, I guess, uh, maybe we connected via social media. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh, you t- tweeted something out and I, I was already a fan of George's and, and, and kind of slid into his comments. <laughs> so unbeknownst to either of us, we'd both been digging through uh, the National Archives, which is uh, over in, uh, across the river from me in Maryland, uh, not knowing what the other was doing. And, you know, we're, we're trying to go through these voluminous files and find out what's available, what's restricted. And there's a lot of stuff that's restricted that's prevented people from, I, we think of writing a definitive account of the fire and what happened on the evening of January 27, 1967. So we've come together. Uh, Matthew is highly organized. Uh, I'm, I'm very analog and, and Matthew's digital and knows how to understand how to get organized on Google drive and so forth. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to introduce him to as many folks as I've come in contact with over the course of the last couple of years since my book came out. And uh, we're going to see what we can come up with. Fantastic. So obviously you guys are doing a lot of research about the fire. Uh, I've seen some of Matthew's tweets about it. Uh, I think one of his recent tweets had to do with the amount of flammable material inside the command module at the time, which to me is just still mind-blowing but why do you guys think this you know the fire is really still a relevant topic you know 55 years later is it it, after it happened you know what can we still learn from this this terrible event you know there really hasn't been a 360 degree analysis of what went wrong you know this was a catastrophic failure in a public-private partnership and you know to me the reason that the accident still resonates today is that we're entering this era of space exploration where we we are leaning very much into the private industry. And and NASA has kind of loosened the leash and said, hey, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin, all these different aerospace companies, you take the lead on, on XYZ endeavors. So it's important to look back if anything, just for the perspective of things that went wrong. And I wrote about this recently in Scientific American. and I kind of talk about how invaluable it is to listen to those that were involved, looking at their oral histories, looking at what went wrong in that era. Of course, technologies continue to progress, but the stories that they tell about their culture of safety, which they purported to have at the time, there, there was still a breakdown. And so understanding why there was a breakdown is important and figuring out how to tackle these types of endeavors in a good way is, is really why it resonates today. So again, I think there are multiple reasons. I mean, George and I were just talking about uh, the Netflix Boeing documentary. Boeing purported to have a culture of safety uh, and quality control, there was a breakdown in that. And so I think taking instances like that and looking back at these types of catastrophic failures and understanding why why the breakdown occurred, that, that's why it's important today. It's definitely relevant just in terms of safety issues that uh, always surround any technological innovation 
Uh, you know, your listeners are, of course, I think, familiar with the problem of Go Fever that overtook the Apollo program. And in 65 and 66, this group think that had overtaken the Apollo program management office. And, you know, they acknowledge this afterward. And, uh, yeah, I, as they said, they got into a big damn hurry and overlooked what seemed like obvious hazards now, pure oxygen, all of these flammable materials. You know, there's a memo that you're probably familiar with, Emily, by a guy named Hillary Page. I mean, it's, it's highly prescient. It's saying, look, we've got a, we got a, a serious problem here with uh, pure oxygen under pressure in the command module. You guys better start thinking about it. And, you know, it just fell by the wayside. They were in a big hurry and they didn't have time. And Bob Cabana, who's now deputy administrator at NASA, made the point during the most recent uh, day of remembrance that, hey, you know, well, the same time span between Apollo 1 and Challenger, Challenger and Columbia. And today, you know, we've got this huge gen- sort of general generational shift within NASA right now, new people, new programs, commercial space. And uh, he was pretty blunt. Uh, Columbia was his first flight as director of flight ops at Kennedy Space Center. And he said last month, I don't ever want to go through another Columbia. And we have to listen, you know, people have to be uh, listened to and they need to be heard. And we need to take the lessons we've learned from those three accidents and, and the deaths of 17 American astronauts and apply it to the things we're doing now because the risks, you know, just continue to mount and you got to do everything you can to minimize them. So, you know, we think this whole question of safety, quality assurance is always relevant, uh, whether it's space, whether it's uh, autonomous vehicles, any of the AI, any of these technologies technologies that are emerging today. Yeah, just quickly piggybacking off of that, you know, George, you had mentioned you know, people's voices really being heard. And I, again, somewhat talk about this in, in my latest Scientific American article and you know, call out Elon Musk's comments towards whistleblowers. Grant, Grant I'm biased. I, I am a whistleblower attorney here in DC. But he, he has somewhat flippantly commented on people blowing the whistle on him. And he's done a tremendous amount in this space. So what, what really irked me about those comments that he made, uh, or the jokes that he made, uh, was the fact that you know, whistleblowers are people that are willing to, you know, raise red flags are critically important. You know, in, in the Apollo 1 uh, situation, you know, there was Thomas Barron, who was quality control, North American, John Dietz, George Mench and Hilliard Page. There were a significant amount of people that were raising issues of, uh, to your point, Emily, the amount of flammable materials, the pure oxygen environment, the rush job that that North American was doing in certain regards. I mean, there, there are stories of tools being left in uh, the command service module that the astronauts would find, things that really would shock you. And, and these, were thing, these were things that, again, were in the, yeah, the Boeing documentary. I think in the Boeing documentary that some of the engineers were saying that there was a ladder at one point found in one of the Boeing structures. So, you know, going back to the relevance, like these things are repeating themselves. And if we're very serious about this era of sp- space exploration, we, we've got to look back to George's point. We have to remember the lessons learned. So people might look at our work as, as uh, being perhaps dangerous or risky of sorts, but I think we train in it and work in it so much that and understand it well enough that we don't look at it from this viewpoint. When Columbia did happen, I mean, obviously, there was a certain culture at NASA that contributed to that accident happening. But I do think that NASA was very open in its investigation, and it it really did try to show what had happened. To their credit, you know, they do have a place now in the VAB where people can access the wreckage and study it. For Apollo 1, to my knowledge, the public was never really given a lot of information, and I feel like NASA even tried to downplay it like if you look at a lot of literature about apollo 1 it calls it as 204 it doesn't call it apollo 1 to me it feels like they really were like okay we don't want to talk about this a lot publicly why do you think that is yeah yeah the whole issue is fraught and it remains 
that way up to this day. I think the damage to the families, you know, the arguments Betty Grissom had with NASA about, you know, what to do with the spacecraft. Uh, I tried to unpack all of these things in, in my account. You're right. Bob Cabana actually displayed a slide during his talk showing the Columbia, what's, what's left of the Columbia shuttle. And he said, you know, it's important for people to see this. And, and a couple of former NASA flight controllers, James Oberg and, and Wayne Hale, have said, you know what, we should probably display the Apollo 1 command module at the Moker in, in Houston so that these flight controllers can understand what they're doing and, and how serious the risks are. To get to your other point, Emily, there was, I think, sort of an important step that was taken during the 50th anniversary observation of the fire in 2017. Um, it was my understanding that Bob Cabana, who at the time was running KSC, negotiated with the families to display the hatches. Mm. And I thought that this was highly significant. At last, Me too. people can see you know, with their own eyes, the hardware that was torched that day. And more than that, they had the good sense in this permanent display at the visitor center to include the time clock where James Cleves and Steve Clemens and these guys punched in and out each day when they were going up to level eight on pad 34. And to acknowledge their heroism, I think was also an important step. I've got a formal in, a request in with a NASA administrator to view the uh, Apollo 1 command module. Uh, I've not heard anything from NASA. I've been down to Langley. I've seen the building where it's stored. It appears that they're, they're attempting to preserve it and, and the components that are also in that storage shed. But uh, the whole issue has been very fraught. And and. I don't know if we're going to resolve any of these issues until perhaps after you know the t direct descendants of the of Ed White and Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee are gone. I mean that's sort of one of the roadblocks we're uh, encountering when we're trying to access the primary sources you would need to do a definitive account of of the fire and it's and, and the investigation and what it all means. Going off of that, you know, great question, Emily and. When I was doing my initial research on the incident, and you know, just for some context, before I came to my current firm, I was a reporter. So I, th I think hearing surface level details about the fire uh, and some of the mystery behind really what went wrong truly, uh, that's what drew me to the story besides my grandfather being there. But as soon as the accident happened, you know, uh, Webb, the administrator at the time, NASA, secured a deal with President Johnson for NASA to investigate itself. Uh, you know, Congress eventually had its bite at the apple, but I think that the 204 Review Board did what they could with the time. I think that they were earnest in their goals to figure out the real reason why. I mean, they still had Kennedy's looming deadline, end of decade deadline. They wanted not only to figure out why they lost members of their team. Uh, something that impacted, uh, you know, the agency greatly from an internal perspective. But they wanted to know what what do we need to do to fix it to to propel ourselves ahead. And you know, I, I'm a firm believer that the accident did lead to that kind of leapfrog. You know, hey, okay, we need to iterate. We need to change uh, X, Y, Z to to get to um, where we're at. I, th I think NASA probably naturally tended to want to keep things tight. During that period, I mean, the press was putting forward an incredible amount of pressure during that time period, as was Congress. Uh, they wanted answers. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if it was an intentionally secretive ordeal or what, to your question, Emily, but, you know, I, I do see that difference between more recent accidents and, and that one. But to George's point about, about the hatch and going back to my grandpa, you know, in 2017, they did open up the, the exhibit at KSC, and it was probably the first time that my grandfather really started to open up about what happened, at least in that time frame. So we got we went before it was open to the public and, and got a private tour. And you know, there was a moment where, you know, my grandfather was staring at 
his old employee ID from North American Aviation, which is on display there. And he was asked to uh, say something, you know, hey, let us know, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? He still couldn't quite bring himself to talk about it in front of people that weren't his family. But as soon as you turn around from, from that specific window, you see the three hatches. And I think for him, seeing those hatches again, it was the first time he had really seen them in decades, uh, was a big moment. And, uh, you know, after visiting the exhibit, we got to go and see uh, a lot of the launch complexes. And uh, I'll remember this till the day I die, but the tour guide was was driving and said, you know, hey, if, if we were to turn left here, uh, you would see uh, launch complex 34. Of course, you guys know the scene of, of the Apollo on fire. And there was kind of this eerie silence on the bus and the grandkids all were kind of looking at grandpa and and he eventually nodded his head. He's like, I want to go back. I want to, I want to see it. And so for the first time really since the accident, he, uh, he went back and, um, you know, it was, I'm not sure if it was that day. It was definitely that time period where him and I had a serious discussion about me taking uh, a leap into investigating more of what happened during the fire writing an account, you know, he, he agreed to let me, you know, do the scientific American piece. And, and there are others that, that will follow, but it was a pivotal moment for him. It was a pivotal moment for our family. And it, it's something that, that I'll never forget. I mean, the arc of his story, he was involved with the manufacturing development of it. He was charged with helping to disassemble it during the investigation. And he eventually was a member of a very small crew. Uh, you know, I think there was like six people, uh, North American and NASA folks, uh, that transported the burnt capsule up the Banana River in Florida and to Langley, Virginia, where it sits to this day, uh, to George's Point. You know, my grandpa's an advocate for putting it on display, and uh, so am I. So um, it's just the full circle element uh, of the story is something that our family uh, treasures and, and makes me uh, uh, realize that it, it, this is a story that needs investigated further. Yeah, I think Lowell Gorsum also uh, has stated that he would like to have it displayed as well. Well, I got to, I've gotten to know Lowell quite well, and I think his preference was to, I don't know if bury is the right term, but actually place it at Launch Complex 34. But I'll ask him the next time I see him. And by the way, uh, David Emily, I'll see him in June because uh, we're going to be dedicating the Apollo 1 Memorial at Arlington National Cemetery. And that's it's tentatively scheduled for June 2nd. So it, that, that was something that took several years. Well, actually, as Lowell says, it only took 55 years. But it's going to be dedicated this summer. So uh, at, at long last. Can I just make one other point? Of course you can. The fire, of course, is the great paradox of the early human uh, space flight, right? That three men had to die on the launch pad in order to build these great machines that we built to get to the moon. And they fixed it. They, they, they changed the uh, cabin atmosphere to a two-gas atmosphere. They put in a hatch that could outward opening hatch, replacing the plug door that could be opened in three seconds. All these things added complexity and weight, which were the big engineering concerns, but they found other ways to take weight off of the Saturn V launch vehicle. And they built this great machine and they sent 24 human beings to another world. So, you know, the great paradox is the fire is the thing that got us to the moon by the end of the 1960s so you have to view it in, the, in that context as well absolutely i always always think about gus's comments as well about the risk and about how he thought that someone would die in that process anyway and it happened to be him but you know when you when you factor that in it's quite quite something i just want to bring up matthew you're posting some really incredible images on your twitter recently i've not seen before and i'm assuming that, oh well i know cuz you're posting about it but they're coming from the national archives and i know earlier you you both said that there's a lot of things that are still restricted do you think that there are things restricted which really should be in the public domain now i'm not talking about the gruesome stuff 
but are there basic bits of information or photos which you can't seem to find, which you know must exist, which would help in our education and, and looking forward and how we can learn from this? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And I'll probably defer to George on the, the latter half of the question. But, you know, thanks for pointing out the images on, on Twitter. I'm fairly new to the game, but, you know, going to the archives, there, there are several different divisions. There's cartographic, textual, motion picture and audio, and still image. So I think George and I have really just scratched the surface in terms of the available materials that are out there, whether it's from the NASA History Office or the National Archives. And you know, just taking a quick pause, you know, I, I have to shout those people out because they are a tremendous resource. The people that work there mm. are a tremendous resource uh, to research researchers. They they want you to get your answers. You know, if you have to FOIA for things, they'll let you know how. Uh, they are an advocate for the public knowing history. And so I've gotten to know a few of, of them there, and it, it's been an, a great process. The, the pandemic has somewhat stalled being able to access certain things, but to George's point, that's going to be the great challenge uh, of this endeavor of fully investigating what went on. The gruesome bits, of course, there's the family to consider, but that's, that's an integral part of the story. In terms of other things that, that we haven't been able to access thus far, it's a little bit early to say, at least in my opinion, I'm sure there are things George could could mention, but it's going to be a process. And you know, the reason that I've really started uh, my social media endeavors in terms of Twitter is just to start a conversation with people. It's like, hey, here's what we're finding. And of course, we're not going to disclose everything, but educating the public is part of the process. Mm. And I think that's what makes this type of research so special is there, there are so many people that are involved in this space, including you two, that um, want to know what's out there and want to know, uh, have access to documents and images and videos. And, and I'll, I'll be posting some of the audio clips and some of the video clips as well that we stumbled upon, but that's why I started it. And again, I'm, I'm very new to it. So I'm, I'm open to suggestions. You know, George and I have a joint Instagram account called Recalling Apollo. We, we kind of post the same types of things there as well. Instagram gives you a little bit longer uh, word count to work with. So that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But anyway, roundabout way of saying that's that's the purpose behind uh, George and I posting some of our research. And I'll, I'll toss it to George to talk about things that we haven't been able to uncover yet in terms of primary sources. And we're aware of additional communications channels during the plugs out test on January 27th, 1967. Most of them are restricted. I'm guessing your listeners are probably familiar with the one channel that has been released that Mark Gray released probably a, a decade or so ago. It's it's very hard to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's awful. But uh, we're aware of, of other communications channels, but that they're restricted under the Freedom of Information Act privacy uh, exemption. And there are other primary sources that you would simply need to see as, as a historian in an attempt to write a definitive account. And so we were trying to shake those things loose. I mean, to NASA's credit, as you both know, they've the oral histories uh, that have been conducted over the last probably three decades are enormously helpful. Uh, there's more material that's been digitized and it's searchable. So that helps as well. But, you know, we're trying to sort of move beyond uh, the standard accounts and, you know, trace how this, would turn out to be a death trap, how this thing was built and how it ever made it to the launch pad. And, you know, what, what are the lessons as, as uh, we send uh, more and more civilians into space? Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I've already subscribed to the blog and I hope our listeners do too. I'm really intrigued to see what you guys uncover in your investigation and your research. Uh, I think this is a topic which is really important, as we've said, and I, I wish you all the best with it. Well, thanks so much for having us on. It was a pleasure. Like I said before, I was a fan before, and I think I'm an even bigger fan now. <laughs> awesome. Likewise. Well, we're glad yeah. to hear that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, Thank great you. to be with you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's always a possibility that uh, you can have a catastrophic failure of course it's going to happen on any fight it's going to happen on 
on the last one as well as the first one. So uh, you just plan as best you can to take care of uh, all of these eventualities. And uh, you get a well-trained crew and you go fly. Wow, that was that was intense, but I'm really glad they're doing this because I've often thought in my mind, like, man, somebody needs to do the, a th- you know, a total like 360 degrees, like investigation of this, like not I don't know re- an investigation, but just like I feel we need to hear just everything that contributed to this, like from the very beginning, whether it happened years before, not just because, you know, we I feel like we still need sort of a, I guess, justice for Grissom, Chaffee, and uh, White, but there's that part of me that feels it's incredibly important for future generations because you just don't want to develop that level of, I wouldn't say complacency, but just arrogance. Like, well, this has never happened to us before, so it's not going to happen, you know? Yeah. It feels like uh, this was a natural uh, step to to talk about after we had Andrew shaking on and, and hearing about his new book a few weeks back to speak to Matthew and, and George about this pretty heavy stuff it's probably the heaviest interview we've done yes you think you know a lot about it but actually we don't know that much and you were right you think about the columbia disaster as you mentioned we've got that great book bringing columbia home where we really learn a hell of a lot about what happened and we don't have an account like that in the public about the fire in my opinion oh, oh in my knowledge to my knowledge i don't think that exists in the same way yes people have written about it it gets mis- mentioned all the time the fire but do we actually really know the the true ins and outs of what happens some would say we don't need to let it let it let the guys rest and so on and so forth but i think actually we do need to learn the lessons from that and it's not just as simple as saying well we know they died and we know there was a fire we know that people neglected certain things actually knowing that stuff and i think about that challenger documentary that came out last year emily and i know it was a really tough watch but i think that was a really important that we were able to to hear about some of the things and the decisions that happened to learn about actually as hard as it is it's essential for especially for for the younger generations to hear about how bad it was both in terms of the things that were neglected in the run-up to it, yep. and how people felt afterwards. Uh, I, th- I think it's really important to see the, the, all sides of it. And I don't think we've necessarily done that with the, the, with the fire. No, not at all. I, I, it's never really gotten a full, like, treatment. Like, you know, Challenger and uh, Columbia did. You know, with Columbia, I feel like NASA's culture, even though obviously it contributed to the accident... Um, I feel like in the aftermath, they really tried to do right by like the families and they really tried to do right by like people who wanted to study that accident, not in a, you know, sort of in a morbid backwards looking way, but in a way that, you know, I know that a lot of people have done their PhDs studying the wreckage of Columbia, basically to study what can happen to the spacecraft at, at hypersonic speeds that undergo something like that. I mean, it sounds very morbid, but it it's probably contributed to a lot of materials, you know, getting better, spacecraft being sturdier, maybe, or, and, you know, obviously preventing something like that from happening again. Yeah. It's horrible that that happened, but, I mean, if you have to look at a silver lining, if you have to say, well, at least something good came out about it, you know, the, the studies afterwards, you know, that came out of it really have drummed it down to, okay, hopefully we're, we're never going to let this happen again. Mm, for sure. So I will post links to George and Matthew's social media profiles within the show notes and, of course, their new blog and Instagram account. Uh, you really do need to check this out if you're interested in this subject. It's fascinating what they're, what they're posting. Stuff I've never seen before, well, I don't think anyone's seen before until they've uncovered it at the National Archives, definitely worth checking out. And as always, if you want to see the full interview, I don't think I cut much out actually, but if you want to see the full interview uh, and watch what we've got up to, then please sign up to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And we accept the risks if there are, what risks there are, and the people we work with uh, do everything that's humanly possible to reduce these risks to as small as possible. And you believe in them? I believe in, uh, I believe very deeply in the people we work with and the crew. I certainly do. 
There have been three launches this week, one from Kennedy Space Center, one in China, and one in Iran. And if you want to know more details, then check out our show notes, where every week I try and post videos, if they exist, and links to information on payloads of the launches. You can find us on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, and there's an archive for older episodes in case you're listening to older episodes and want to check something out. Okay, so let's start up with the uh, follow-up to what is happening as a result of the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Once again, we'll stress that we know that the implications of spaceflight are really of minimal importance compared to what the people of Ukraine are going through. But we're a space podcast, so this is what we're covering. We did mention last week that it wasn't clear what is happening with the upcoming OneWeb launch from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, which is managed and run by Roscosmos and Russian Aerospace Forces. Roscosmos announced on March 2nd that they would not go ahead with the launch unless OneWeb guaranteed that the satellites would not be used for military purposes. They also stipulated that the British government had to sell their shares in the company. The British company responded by suspending all launches from the site and pulling out its employees. The satellites have been removed from the Soyuz rocket, but it's not clear what will happen to them. OneWeb is building a broadband network similar to SpaceX's Starlink. They've got 420 satellites in orbit currently and are aiming to have 648. France-based company Ariane Spas has been launching the satellites using Soyuz rockets. The head of Roscosmos, Dimitri Rogozin, has also been making more statements. On Friday the 4th of March, he announced that the agency will no longer sell rocket engines to U.S. companies, saying, and I quote, let them fly on something else, their broomsticks. Although this ban won't affect too many US companies, there's only one major consequence, really, and that's Northrop Grumman, who used the RD-181 engine on its Antares rocket. They also supply United Launch Alliance with RD-180 engines for the Atlas V launcher, but United Launch Alliance has announced that it has enough of those engines to fly out the remaining missions of the Atlas V. Roscosmos has also announced that it is ceasing all joint German and Russian science experiments on the International Space Station. And the German Aerospace Center has announced that they'll cease all science experiments uh, on joint Russian satellites. So we're getting a little bit more clarity about the fallout of what is happening, but it's still changing very quickly. There was also a crazy exchange on Twitter between former astronaut Scott Kelly and Rogozin. It's <laughs> all very crazy still and changing rapidly. Yeah, it is. Uh, meanwhile, on Mars, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to like change the subject gracefully as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the Perseverance rover has collected its seventh rock sample. The plan is to get one more sample from its current location before moving on to an ancient river delta. Percy landed on Mars just over a year ago now and has been exploring the Jezero crater floor to the south and west of its landing site. To get to the accessible area of the ancient delta, Percy will have to travel back past the landing zone, and its route is being planned using data provided by the Ingenuity helicopter, which is pretty cool. Love that. Talking of rovers, new images have been shared by the Chinese from the U-22 rover on the far side of the moon. We talked about this last week because of the glass globules that the rover has found. However, this week we have a wonderful time-lapse image showing the path of its travels across the lunar landscape. U-22 landed on the moon in January 2019 on top of the Chang'e 4 lander, becoming the first spacecraft to land and operate on the far side of the moon. And since then, the rover has travelled 3,376 feet, which is, a for uh, you metric-loving people, 1,029 metres across the Van Karman crater. We've also had some great photos above of the rover moving around, taken by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. U-22 was only supposed to live for three months on the moon, and yet here it still is. It survives by operating for two weeks when the sun shines and then powering down for the cold lunar night. It's currently on its 40th lunar day. The concept of a lunar day is really something I've not got my head around yet, Emily. And with lunar bases potentially becoming a reality in the next decade, it's something we've really got to think about, isn't it? Imagine being in the dark for two weeks. Yeah, nighttime is like two weeks long. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're going to need a sun lamp or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Back on Earth, but still somewhat having to do with the moon, NASA is gearing up to roll out Artemis 1 to the launch pad on March 17th. I'll probably be fast asleep when it's doing that. (laughs) Um, let's be honest. We've been speaking about this for ages. 
And, and it's really hard to imagine this actually happening. It's going to be really surreal to see. I'm probably going to wake up and see it and be like, what the heck? I know. It's going to be know. like a present. Um, <laughs> it'll be awesome. I can't wait. I know. I can't wait. It's going to be so cool to see on the pad. However, NASA's Inspector General has told lawmakers that the first crewed landing of the Artemis program will be no earlier than 2026, as both the spacesuits and the lunar landing system won't be ready in time. They give with one hand and, and take with the other, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? they do. But yeah, that rollout's going to be fun. If it actually happens, I'm so excited for yeah. it. It's exciting enough seeing the images of it within the in the vehicle assembly building, let alone actually seeing it roll out. That's going to be something. Yeah. It's got the worm on it, which I'm uh, uh, very nostalgically excited to see. I think that's so cool. It, it would. Oh my goodness. Ooh. It's gonna be. <laughs> it's gonna be hot. I can't wait to see it. There's that worm on it, and I'm like, there's that part of me that's like. I wish there was a 70s astronaut on it. Like, Vance Brand is commanding. Like, yes! Uh, that would be <laughs> yes, something, that it? would be freaking amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, there have been some other announcements, too. Rocket Lab have said that they're going to build their reusable neutron rocket on Wallops Island in Virginia. And I hope that it will be debuted in 2024. NASA have also ordered three more SpaceX Crew Dragon flights to the space station. Romania have signed the Artemis Accords, and the moon got hit by the unknown rocket. We think. We haven't <laughs> actually seen it, but those tracking it say it has done. And, you know, hopefully that's the end of that saga, Emily. Yeah, hopefully we never have to hear about it ever again. <laughs> no, until the movie comes until, out. Yeah. <laughs> until the movie comes out 20 years from now about the uh, a non-event. Yeah. And finally, two stories with some links to previous episodes. You may remember we interviewed the CEO of Blue Shift Aerospace last April about their plans for rockets powered by uh, biofuel. Well, on March 1st, the company tested the largest ever commercial rocket engine powered by non-toxic, carbon-neutral, bio-derived fuel. Uh, this is fantastic news for this company who hoped to complete a suborbital launch this year and to be fully orbital by 2024. Also, the moon gallery we discussed in episode 77 has been unpacked on the ISS, and they published the first photo of the gallery floating in front of the cupola on the ISS. It's a, it's really a wonderful thing to see. And uh, check out episode 77 if you have no idea what we're talking about. Okay, I'm out. Okay, you're down. Okay, I'm turning over. Okay, you're down. Give me up. Oh, there you are. And that's it for this week. A darker episode, but I'm very much intrigued to find out what George and Matthew uncover with their research on the fire. But also, I like that we ended on a bit more of a positive note with regards to... Uh, Blue Shift and the, the Moon Gallery. I thought that was a nice touch there, Emily. Yep. Uh, thank you once again, everyone, for all your support, whether it's hitting the share button, buying our merchandise, leaving a review, or signing up to Patreon. It all really helps. 80 episodes, and we're still going strong. Absolutely. Yes, and here's to the next 80. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions. <laughs>